spoiler warning. I will be spoiling the entire first book, A Game of Thrones. So if you have not read the first book or seen the first season of the show, click off now. Oh my gosh. Is everything okay? You're freaking me I, out. I can't stop thinking about this thing in A Game of Thrones. Does she not know this book came out 25 years ago? Why does she care so much? It's just like people blame Sansa for killing Ned, even though she's 11 years old. What is wrong with you? Hey nerds, what's up? It's time for me to defend Sansa Stark. One of the most surprising things I learned after reading A Game of Thrones this year was how many people in the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom hate Sansa for completely unwarranted reasons that in my opinion are not supported within the text. My goal today is not to make Sansa your favorite character. If by the end of this video you still dislike her and she annoys you, that is your right. But my goal is to prove that blaming Sansa for Ned's death is completely unwarranted. And overall, that the fandom is a little bit hypocritical critical when it comes to their feelings on Sansa. One thing I want to get out of the way right away that is extremely important is that I will only be talking about the book today. I, first of all, haven't seen the show. And second of all, I know the show changes some key elements, like for example, aging up the characters that I do think significantly changes the flavor of what happens. So today we will only be focusing on what happens within the text, Game of Thrones. I came with receipts, by the way. We got some time today. First, we are going to start with a few key scenes from the text, starting with Sansa's scenes with Circe and Joffrey concerning Ned's death at the end. Then we are going to go and examine a scene that happens earlier in the novel between Sansa, Joffrey, Arya, and Micah and talk about how that scene plays out. We're gonna talk a little bit about historical accuracy and medieval Europe and how that's often used in conversations surrounding a Game of Thrones. And finally, we are going to end the discussion surrounding the strong female character in fantasy and how that might influence our perceptions on Sansa as a whole. Are you ready? Let's get into it. So we are gonna go over Sansa as a character later in this video, but first we do need to establish some things about our character before we go into these arguments, in that yes, Sansa is a character who is in love with fairy tales and knights and honor and princesses. But I think it's important to acknowledge that nothing about her upbringing up until this point would have made her viewpoint incorrect or why she shouldn't think that way. Yes, she grew up in the North, which is definitely a more difficult place to grow up, but she grew up as the daughter of nobles in a pretty privileged position. She has a loving family. She gets along with her siblings for the most part outside of like normal, I think, sibling, you know, arguments. She lives under a father who is notoriously known for his honor. Really, there's nothing in her current worldview or her current life experience that would challenge her kind of fairy tale, simplistic worldview. And I think that's really important to acknowledge up front. Additionally, Sansa is 11 years old in the book. 11. That would put you in either fifth or sixth grade in the United States, so elementary school. Sansa is a literal child. Okay, with that info in mind, let's read some passages. So let's start out when Sansa talks to Circe and we already see that Circe is like laying on the manipulation very thickly. Circe smiled to see her and Sansa thought it was the sweetest and saddest smile she had ever seen. Sansa, my sweet child, she said, I know you've been asking for me. I'm sorry that I could not send for you sooner. Matters have been very unsettled and I have not had a moment. I trust my people have been taking good care of you. Sweet Sansa, Queen Circe said, laying a soft hand on her wrist. Such a beautiful child. I do hope you know how much Joffrey and I love you. You do? Sansa said breathless. Littlefinger was forgotten. Her prince loved her. Nothing else mattered. The queen smiled. I think of you almost as my own daughter, and I know the love you bear for Joffrey. She gave a weary shake of her head. I am afraid we have some grave news about your lord father. You must be brave, child. Okay, so again, very manipulative, very into Sansa's want of love and being accepted and being in a fairy tale and a princess. And right after this, we find out that Sansa was the one who told Cersei of Ned's plans to send his family away. 
Now, I know I've already read a lot of passages, but it's really important I read this one out loud, word for word, because I think it says a lot about Sansa's mindset. How well I know that child, Circe said, her voice so kind and sweet. Why else should you have come to me and told me of your father's plan to send you away from us, if not for love? It was for love, Sansa said in a rush. Father wouldn't even give me leave to say farewell. She was the good girl, the obedient girl, but she had felt as wicked as Arya that morning, sneaking away from Septa Mordain, defying her lord father. She had never done anything so willful before, and she would never have done it then if she hadn't loved Joffrey as much as she did. He was going to take me back to Winterfell and marry me to some hedge knight, even though it was Joff I wanted. I told him, but he wouldn't listen. The king had been her last hope. The king could command father to let her stay in King's Landing and marry Prince Joffrey. Sansa knew he could, but the king had always frightened her. He was loud and rough-voiced and drunk as often as not, and he would probably have just sent her back to Lord Eddard, if they'd even let her see him. So she went to the queen instead and poured out her heart, and Cersei had listened and thanked her sweetly. Only then, Sir Aris had escorted her to the high room in Maegor's holdfast and posted guards, and a few hours later, the fighting had begun outside. Please, she finished, you have to let me marry Joffrey. I'll be ever so good a wife to him, you'll see. I'll be a queen just like you, I promise. Okay, so these three passages I just read out, which are a part of kind of the same larger scene, establish some really important things about what I've seen the fandom say about Sansa. This is kind of what most of the fandom points to very quickly when they say, see, it's Sansa's fault Ned is dead. Sansa killed Ned by telling Cersei his plans. Like, she told Cersei of all people the plans. How could she? She killed him. Okay, but three things here. One, Sansa has very little reason to distrust Cersei. Now, of course, it is Cersei's fault that Lady dies, but I think in Sansa's view, this is all stemming from Arya and her lack of decorum, and that's where Sansa puts that blame, even if it doesn't make sense or not. So besides that scene, really, Sansa has no reason to distrust Cersei. She she doesn't know. We're, we're the adults in the room who understand what a terrible person Cersei is and what she has done behind the scene. We are omniscient in a way that Sansa isn't, and we somehow blame her for not being omniscient. Of course she would look up to Cersei, who probably in Sansa's vision is exactly what she imagines a queen should be, right? We know Cersei is beautiful. She is commanding. She has charisma. We also, as people living in this day and age, especially like I'm from the United States, have trouble understanding why you would feel such reverence for commanders or leaders. Like none of us would feel a huge reverence, I think, meeting a president of the United States. Like it would be a cool experience. I think it would be exciting, but I don't think you would have this like sense of awe. At the time, like queens and leaders and princes, like they commanded a lot of awe and respect and overwhelm, especially for someone who is 11 and reveres that type of thing. That would have been very overwhelming for Sansa and it makes sense that she would trust Cersei. And we understand why she wouldn't go to Robert. Ned even confirms, I think at some point in the book, he says like out of the mouth of babes when Sansa calls like Robert scary and drunk and a useless king. Like why would Sansa go to Robert? Number two, that's extremely important. Ned did not tell Sansa why she had to leave. I can read the scene, but Ned, just all he says is, hey, for your safety, we're leaving, and oh, you don't want to marry Joffrey. I'm just going to marry you off to a hedge knight. That's all he says. He doesn't tell Sansa about the incest. He doesn't tell Sansa about this giant plot and how they could fear for their lives and this whole stuff is going down and Robert's been murdered. Sansa doesn't know any of that. Yes, as readers, we know that. Sansa doesn't. She probably just views it as her dad just crushing her dreams. Children are notorious for this, right? Notorious for not trusting or understanding when a parent just says, do what I say because I said it. What reason does she have to believe that this decision is life or death for her and her family at 11 years old? Once again, it's us as readers putting knowledge we have unfairly onto Sansa as if she should have the same knowledge. And three, let's talk a little bit about child psychology. Children are notoriously focused on self. As a child, she doesn't have the worldview to think, how will this affect others? She can only think about how these decisions, decisions will affect her. Now, uh, research shows that this kind of self-centered focus um, is mostly between ages six and 12. So Sansa falls definitely within that. But also like teenagers are notoriously known for this as well, for bad decision-making because they can't think outside of the moment. Like that is what teens are known for. So the fact that an 11 year old is kind of focused on how it's affecting her and not the wider family or taking a moment to critically think at 11 makes perfect sense. As the scene continues, it's also important to note that Sansa never believes her father is a traitor. In fact, she says multiple times, like, it must be a mistake, he wouldn't do that. Sansa doesn't just like betray Ned. 
not in the way that everyone tries to claim. And it's also important to realize that there are three very intimidating adults in the room. This is Sansa alone with Circe, Littlefinger, and I'm forgetting, the Grandmaster, okay? All bearing, looming down on her and telling her how to think and feel at 11. I'd be intimidated as a full adult in a room with those people. She even says, Sansa wanted Joffrey desperately, but she did not think she had the courage to do as the queen was asking. But he never, I don't, your grace, I wouldn't know what to say. The queen says, we'll tell you what to say. The Grand Master threatens that her family will be in physical danger if she doesn't. Then Circe goes on to say, oh, well, Sansa, you must be a traitor if you won't admit that your father's not a traitor. Like, that's intimidating. And then it becomes clear that Sansa truly believes Joffrey's a good person and she hatches this plan in her mind, like, okay, they'll banish my father, but then I'm gonna get married and in like a year or two after I have a child, Joffrey will just pardon my dad and he'll come back. And like from Sansa's point of view, that makes sense. She doesn't feel like this moment is life or death. She truly thinks she'll get to pardon her dad. And then let's give Sansa some more credit. She gets the courage in front of everyone, in front of an entire court and adults that are so intimidating to go up and ask Joffrey herself for a pardon for her father in front of everybody. You don't think that took bravery to do that? Like an intense amount of bravery? Okay, and then we know the final scene. <laughs> Joffron's Ned dead, so he cuts off Ned's head. Now it's very important to note here, Joffre asked for the death. Uh, Cersei did not want Ned dead. That is said either at the end of this book or in the very beginning of Clash of Kings that Cersei did not expect that to happen and did not want Ned to die. Why does that matter? Simple. Yes. Does Sansa telling Cersei that information lead to Ned's death? Yes. But that is the tragedy of it, not the blame of it. The idea that you could blame Sansa for all of this, for telling Cersei that piece of information, when Ned himself is the one who got the ball rolling by confronting Cersei in the first place and being honest about it instead of just moving behind the scenes is wild to me. Additionally, Cersei never planned on killing Ned. She admits as much as I said. So Sansa coming to Cersei with this knowledge isn't like actually a direct line to Ned's death. Who is to blame for Ned's death? Joffrey. Joffrey's to blame. It's very simple. Okay, I probably haven't convinced you yet, and honestly, I hadn't expected to from this information. But we're gonna move on to a couple of other things. And the first scene we're gonna go to includes a little truth bomb I'd like to drop on ya. If you blame Sansa for Ned's death, you have to blame Arya for Micah's death. That's right, I said what I said. Let's go to the text. If it's been a while since you've read the book, as a reminder, Sansa and Joffrey were riding in the woods together and come across Arya and Micah sword fighting and Joffrey's being the worst like usual and tries to get Micah to fight him. And this is the ensuing scene. And you're only a butcher's boy and no knight. Joffrey lifted Lion's tooth and laid it point on Micah's cheek below the eye as the butcher boy stood trembling. That was my lady's sister you were hitting. Do you know that? A bright bud of blood blossomed where his sword pressed into Micah's flesh and a slow red line trickled down the boy's cheek. Stop it, Arya screamed. She grabbed up her fallen stick. Sansa was afraid. Arya, you stay out of this. I won't hurt him much, Prince Joffrey told Arya, never taking his eyes off the butcher's boy. Arya went for him. Sansa slid off her mare, but she was too slow. Arya swung with both hands. There was a loud crack as the wood split against the back of the prince's head, and then everything happened at once before Sansa's horrified eyes. Joffrey staggered and whirled around, roaring curses. Micah ran for the trees as fast as his legs would take him. Arya swung at the prince again, but this time Joffrey caught the blow on Lion's Truth and sent her broken stick flying from her hands. The back of his head was all bloody and his eyes were on fire. Sansa was shrieking, no, no, stop it, stop it, both of you, you're spoiling it. But no one was listening. Arya scooped up a rock and hurled it at Joffrey's head. She hit his horse instead and the blood bay reared and went galloping off after Micah. Stop it, don't, stop it, Sansa screamed. Joffrey slashed at Arya with his sword, screaming obscenities, terrible words, filthy words. Arya darted back, frightened now, but Joffrey followed, hounding her toward the woods, backing her up against a tree. Sansa didn't know what to do. She watched helplessly and was blind from tears. Then a gray blur flashed past her and suddenly Nymeria was there, leaping, jaws closing around Joffrey's sword arm. The steel fell from his fingers as the wolf knocked him off his feet and they rolled in the grass, the wolf snarling, ripping at him and the prince shrieking in pain. Get it off, he screamed, get it off. If Arya hadn't attacked Joffrey, there is a very good chance that Micah would still be alive. Probably as good of a chance that Ned would still be alive if Sansa hadn't told Cersei their plans. 
Yet, not a single person blames Arya, but a lot of people blame Sansa. And it's easy to see why, of course. I get it. We love to see Arya attack Joffrey because he is the worst and we are rooting for it. And we hate to see Sansa trust Cersei because we are adults with omniscient presence and we know that Cersei can't be trusted. But that doesn't change the facts. If you blame Sansa for Ned's death, you have to blame Arya for Micah's death because it is Arya's actions that lead to the domino effects that lead to Micah's death. Of course, I don't blame either girl for either death. I blame Joffrey, the fault of whose both deaths are. And as a side note, because I know some of you like to blame Sansa for Micah's death too, because some of y'all apparently hate her. Number one, Arya lied about how much she hurt Joffrey, which implies that Arya knew she was very in the wrong and was pretty scared about it too. Sansa literally never says Joffrey is right. The exact quote from the book is, I don't know, she said tearfully, looking as though she wanted to bolt. I don't remember, everything happened so fast, I didn't see. And three, Micah was dead before Sansa opened her mouth. The Hound returns with his dead body before anything is decided in that little scene. Nothing Sansa did or didn't say would have changed the outcome because the Hound had already run him down. Joffrey made that decision long before this little meeting happened. Okay, so before we move on to my next two points, I do need to clarify something. I love Arya. She's one of my favorite characters in the entire series. So none of what I'm about to say is meant to be a criticism or like dislike towards Arya. I love her. I am just using Arya as a convenient comparison point to Sansa and how they are treated very differently in the fandom and I want to explore some of those reasons. So I've actually previously made an entire video on the concept of historical accuracy and fantasy, particularly talking about the issue of sexual assault and sexism since so much fantasy is set in medieval Europe. We aren't going to go into that particularly here, but I wanted to bring it up because it's a very known concept, right? We often talk about, well, it was medieval Europe. Things were different back then. Like that's the argument that's brought up if assault or sexism in any way is, is brought up in a book. People will be like, well, it was medieval Europe. That's how it was. So I find it a little funny dare I say a little hypocritical that people blame Sansa so much for how she views things when technically for medieval Europe isn't she supposed to be this way isn't the way isn't this like her doing her duty isn't she being the most a part of her historically accurate story she is the daughter of nobles she is a noble woman her <laughs> role in life is to marry well to make strong alliances for her house that is what she will have been raised to do she is the firstborn daughter she would be expected to know how to run a household how to entertain guests to know a lot about political alliances and how she is going to help and overall provide heirs <laughs> provide children and take care of those children that is what would be expected of her. Why shouldn't Sansa take pride in that role or be looking forward to it if that's what she's literally been raised to do? Sansa is exactly how she should be. She cares a lot about propriety. She cares a lot about how she looks and presents herself. And she's good at it. There are a lot of scenes I marked in here and I won't read them where she displays an incredibly high knowledge of the court and expectations. The scene I specifically think about is I think right before her and Joffrey go out, on that little horse ride she's confronted with a lot of different people and they ask like oh do you know these people and she can name them all because of their banners and her knowledge like she's good at it she studied she dreams of being married to a prince and having his babies what part of her living in this time period should have taught her to want anything else i mean technically Arya is the character who's not doing what she should be doing for her time period in this case and in fact ned addresses that in several scenes i can read some out i wasn't playing Arya insisted i hate septa mordain that's enough her father's voice was curt and hard the septa is doing no more than is her duty though gods know you have made it a struggle for the poor woman your mother and i have charged her with an impossible task of making you a lady i don't want to be a lady Arya flared i do not mean to frighten you but neither will i lie to you we have come to a dark dangerous place child this is not winterfell we have enemies who mean us ill. We cannot fight a war among ourselves. This willfulness of yours, the running off, the angry words, the disobedience. At home, these were only the summer games of a child. Here and now, with winter soon upon us, that is a different matter. It is time to begin growing up. I find it ironic and, dare I say yes, a little hypocritical, that the it's historical argument will cover sexual assault criticisms for a story, but 
don't cover Sansa acting as she should in this time period. Said she's hated for it. We want to hate her for not being more like Arya. And yes, Arya is so lovable, but we hate Sansa for being who she should be and being honestly more in the right for this time period in her story. Now, there is a reason I think we as readers tend to naturally gravitate more towards Arya than Sansa in the story. And like, obviously, yes, because Arya is awesome, but beyond that, and I hope you don't mind because I'm gonna get a little personal with it this time. If I had read this series even 10 years ago, I think I probably would have been on the Sansa hate train with everyone else who's on that train. There's a few things that have happened though and made me feel very differently reading it at this time in my life, which is A, just getting older, and B, having children of my own. I covered parts of this in my strong female character video, but I don't think we realize how much we often value male strength or male interests, or et cetera, in our female strong characters. We often find things that are labeled as typically feminine to be stupid, silly, vapid, childish, etc. Growing up, I was often attracted to male dominated activities. Math was always my favorite subject. I loved video games and reading fantasy books. And then I went into a male dominated career field. And I will, can't explain how praised I was for those things. I was praised all the time. Wow, you're a girl and you like math. Wow, you like video games. Like, it, and I, it started affecting me. It, it started being like, wow, I am, this is good. I am cool because I like more male things and not these typical feminine things. And if you think of like the opposite way, you rarely, or if ever, I don't think I've ever seen it, that sort of praise heaped on a little boy who is more interested in typically feminine things. I mean, you can even see it in our language where there is a word like tomboy, but there is no equivalent word for boys. And I don't think I really ever confronted this or thought much about this until I had a daughter of my own. I already had an older son and I remember thinking to myself, well, like, because I had the son first, we have all like the boy toys and my daughter won't be raised to like all this girly stuff. She won't be like into pink and princesses. Like, we're not going to do that thing. We're going to raise her differently. Now, if you're a parent, you're probably already laughing because you understand the punchline of this joke, which is that you can never decide what your kids are into and it is a totally losing battle. And so who do I have? A daughter who could not be more in love with pink, rainbows, unicorns, princesses, uh, everything girly you could possibly imagine she loves through honestly direct opposition for me personally. <laughs> And so within myself, I had to confront this clear <laughs> internalized misogyny I had against feminine things. What was wrong that she liked all this feminine stuff? Nothing. I liked that stuff as I was a little kid. It wasn't until I got older and was socialized to believe that the like male interests of mine were cooler and better that I like tried to push that stuff off like it was somehow bad. There was absolutely nothing wrong with those interests. It, it, it was me that was the problem. And there's this other element to it too, which is that I know that girls growing up who had the same interests as me, but were not interested in presenting themselves in like a typical feminine way. Like I have always been into makeup and dressing very femininely. And if the girls who had my same interests didn't do that, they also weren't praised as much. Like growing up as a girl, it was like this very specific thing growing up of look feminine enough be feminine enough, but also be praised for having these male interests, despite still having that like display of typical femininity. And girls who didn't do that didn't experience the same like level of praise I did for those same things, which is a whole nother element that needs to be wrapped in. And so when I started reading all these comments and realizing how the fandom treats Arya versus how it treats Sansa, I couldn't help but feel that this was an element involved, whether or not it was conscious. Arya really is our kind of typical male strength female character. She is feisty and is good at fighting and hiding and so, uh, you know, bold and out there and eschews this typical femininity. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a real female. That's a real person. That's a real character. And she feels real. And, and so there's nothing wrong with that. It's just when we start saying that Arya is so much better and so much more worthy of our love because of this, when we compare to Sansa, our typically female behaving character who likes typically feminine stuff, and we deride her for that. 
Charlotte, the girl who loves fairy tales and princesses and princes and knights and wants to get married and have children. Why do we have to decide to hate Sansa for that instead of just viewing Sansa and Arya as very different characters with different interests in their lives? Honestly, I got a comment a couple of days ago that really made my day and I think just basically sums up what I just explained in like the last 30 minutes very clearly. Michael Anderson 5301 said, one good point previously mentioned was that if Sansa and Arya switched their experiences growing up, that is each going through what the other went through, neither one of them would have survived. Period. Period. Sansa going through everything Arya went through, she could never. She couldn't she wouldn't be strong enough. But guess what? Arya also doesn't have enough knowledge and isn't strong enough to go through what Sansa has to go through. More particularly like as the fallout of this in books two and three. I don't want to spoil those books since I specifically said I wouldn't. But what Sansa has to go through, Arya would not have the knowledge, the understanding, the ability to navigate that in the way Sansa does. They are both extremely strong, extremely brave characters, just with different skill sets. Anyway, I hope I maybe encouraged you to view Sansa differently, even if you don't have a lot of love for her. And I hope we can finally put to rest this whole Sansa is responsible for Ned's death because I just feel like it's willfully misinterpreting the story and I'll end on that strong note. <laughs> Uh, if you like these kind of deep dives and video essays, please like and subscribe. That is the best way to support me. I'm sure I will have many more as I continue my Song of Ice and Fire journey. If you want to see what I am currently reading, as well as other nerdy rants, you can check me out on Instagram at bookborn.reviews. I'll see you next time. Bye.